Hi everybody, this is Gad Saad. I'm very much looking forward to bringing you uh, this chat that I had uh, earlier this morning with Yaron Brook, uh, truly all-encompassing chat. If you do watch it and if you appreciate all of the sizable effort and time commitment that it takes to provide you with such content, I do hope that you'll consider supporting my efforts through uh, my Patreon and or PayPal accounts. Okay, guys, a few months ago I appeared on his show and now he's been gracious enough to accept my reciprocal invitation to come on mine. We've got uh, Yaron Brook on the show. How are you doing, Yaron? I'm doing well. How about you, Gav? Good, good. Thank you. I'm pronouncing yeah. it in the English way. Would it be Yaron if it were in, in Hebrew or how would you do it? Yaron. Yaron, okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, this gentleman, he is the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute. And uh, let me just list for you here his books. Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Idea Can End Big Government, Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality, and In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance. Did I miss any other important ones or are we good? No, those, those are the, those are the big three. three. Those, those are the, the big three, the trilogy. <laughs> uh, so I thought what we do, what we talked you know, before coming on the show about what, you know, how we would like to structure this conversation. And I think we both agreed that there there's enough stuff keeping our attention in current events that we could probably fill a couple of hours. So we'll just start off with some of the current events and see where it takes us. What do you think? Yeah, no, that'd be fun. That'd be fun. All right. So let's start with the Pittsburgh attack. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we're, I mean, not that it should matter because it's a heinous attack, whether you're Jewish or not, but we're both Jewish, yet I think you hinted at the fact that what I'm going to ask you next, we might end up having different opinions on it. Uh, what do you think about the accusations levied against Donald Trump that his rhetoric is directly responsible for the Pittsburgh attack? Well, obviously, nobody's directly responsible for the Pittsburgh attack except the attacker, right? So full moral responsibility on the bastard, the evil bastard who did this. I mean, he was... Uh, he was primed to do something. If you follow his tweets, I mean, he's a, he was an anti-Semite who was just ready to, to go and do something. So uh, he, he bears full 100 percent moral responsibility to it. I do, though, believe that the culture that we live in right now, the kind of attitudes, the rhetoric, the the is is encourages these people to come out of the woodwork. It encourages them to be bolder than they otherwise would be. And it, it increases their anger and frustration, the tribalism that exists today in America politically. And, and, and I, I blame Donald Trump partially for that. And I blame, of course, the left. I think the left, I left it their primary responsibility, primarily because they, I don't think we'd have a Donald Trump if not for the left. I think Donald Trump is kind of a, a, a backlash to identity politics and the, the vulgarity and the violence of the left. And many Americans going, enough is enough. We're going we're gonna to have our own. Uh, you know, same type on 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 the right. Uh, you know, I, I, there, there are a number of issues that uh, Donald Trump makes a big deal out of that I think uh, incite people. Again, I don't think it's directly inciting. I, I, again, the moral responsibility is always on the person. Uh, and, and but the fact that uh, our culture has become more violent, our, our political discourse has become more violent. When Donald Trump calls the media. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the enemy of the people when when he when he I think is creates this hysterical attitude towards a caravan of 7000 migrants who maybe a thousand will arrive in the border, which is below what usually arrive every day at the border. But suddenly we have to send troops to the border and, and there's a kind of a panic around it and there's a national hysteria around it. I think all of this encourages an emotionalism in a culture, a culture that responds emotionally, our president responds emotionally. Our intellectuals are all emotionalists. Uh, you know, the, the academia is all emotionalist. We see, we, we see, you know, Me Too, you know, is, you know, the Kavanaugh, which was all driven by emotion. Forget facts, forget evidence. It's all about emotion. We live in an emotionless culture to which Donald Trump encourages, uh, supports, throws fuel on a fire. And I think we're going to see a more violent political world out there as a consequence of this kind of rhetoric. See, I mean, uh, it's fine. I, I, I buy a lot of what you're saying. My, I guess my main concern would be who, what was sort of the first cause of the hysteria? So in other words, Donald Trump to me 
uh, can engage in some, you know, inflammatory rhetoric, rhetoric that is not quite as presidential and, you know, tempered as one would like him to have. But I see it as he is reacting to the zeitgeist of hysteria that already exists. So in a sense, in my view, he is doing the following. Uh, he's walking down an alley, not hoping to be violent. But then if somebody accosts him and is violent to him, then he responds violently. And then people say, but look at this guy, he's violent. But he's responding to that violence. So I think that if people were maybe a bit more fair to him, if the mainstream media maybe were not quite as hysteric, if our intellectuals were not as quite collective Munchausen, you know, it's nuclear holocaust because Donald Trump has become president, maybe maybe he would be a bit gentler. Do you think there is merit to this possibility? No, I, I don't think Donald Trump is gentle, and I don't think he was elected to be gentle. I, You know, he was elected as part of the zeitgeist, and the zeitgeist is a combative, uh, you know, the media is what it is. It didn't change with the Donald Trump election. It's always been biased. It just Donald Trump brings it out more so in them than, than we've seen in the past. And and to some extent, deservingly so. I mean, he I mean, I, I am a I do not like anything about Donald Trump. I mean, he's he's coarse. He's he's not thoughtful. He's not rational. He's a complete and utter pragmatist. He's short term and he should be criticized. And uh, the media goes overboard. I agree. But. Uh, it goes overboard by about the same proportion, given the character of Donald Trump, that it has in the past. And I generally think, you know, people exaggerate the role of the media today. I mean, if you think about the media, the power of the networks, the power of Fox and CNN and so on, is so much less than the power of the three network was when Donald, Ronald Reagan was elected. Right? right? When Ronald Reagan was elected, they all hated his guts. They make fun of him constantly. Saturday night would not stop making fun of Ronald Reagan. And it didn't matter. Ronald Reagan stayed a gentleman and Ronald Reagan stayed a powerful force for the good, and, you know, mostly. And it, he got reelected. He got elected once and he got reelected. Today you have God's, God on, on, on YouTube. You have Dave Rubin on YouTube. You have Jordan Peterson. You have so many voices everywhere that, that the power of the media has been diminished dramatically and yet you know, we still make this huge deal about the media. So, no, I think I think the real problems with, with Trump and his rhetoric, I think he was elected in order to do this. I don't think he's disappointing his fans. The people who voted for him, he's, he's living up to expectations. But I think he is a symbol of the crudeness with which now the right, that the right has adopted in addition to the left. Uh, and, and he's taking it to the next level. And I think that ne next level is very dangerous. Because one could only imagine what would happen when it's taken to the next level, right? I mean, this is a progression. This is indeed a slippery slope. He he has authoritarian tendencies, just like Barack Obama had. Just again, he's taken it a little bit to the next level, and the next guy will take it a little bit more. And it, it the whole phenomenon scares me, particularly when, uh, you know, he I, he doesn't tell his supporters to go be violent, but he kind of makes fun when they do, and he, he thinks lightly of it. He, he talks lightly of body slamming a journalist by a congressman. Now, a lot of people do that, right? But he's the president of the United States. You imply this. I mean, there is a, there's, a, there's a significance to being president. There's a moral responsibility to being president. And we've never had a president who takes that moral responsibility so lightly as, as Trump. So I, I do think he deserves criticism. And I think it's important that some of us who are perceived to be on the right. I don't consider myself on the right exactly, but I consider myself on a third dimension. But those of us who are perceived on the right criticize him because otherwise there's no correct mechanism. Otherwise, he's only criticized on the left and therefore nobody takes him seriously. See, I get the feeling... I, seriously. Right. I, I, I mentioned this recently on... Uh, I appeared on Greg, Greg Gutfeld's uh, show and yeah. I'll be discussing uh, the, the point that I'm about to make next in my forthcoming book. So in... Uh, in uh, Psychology of persuasion and advertising, for example, there is this model called the elaboration likelihood model, which basically says that when you're trying to persuade people, you could engage them through one of two routes of persuasion, either through the central route or the peripheral route. Central route is I give you, you know, cognitive justifications as to why you should buy my product. Here are the seven reasons why my mutual fund is superior. Peripheral cues would be you just show a beautiful woman riding on a horse. For example, for a perfume ad, which is a hedonic uh, product, you're not going sure. to say, here are the 18 physiological reasons according to Harvard chemists, right? 
So, yeah. so depending on the type of product category, you will engage a different, uh, if you like, uh, persuasive system. Well, I argue that much of the hatred toward Trump is because the peripheral cues associated to Trump, his style, his manner of speaking, the way he holds himself is very unattractive. It's what I call an aesthetic injury to the highfalutin, you know, ivory tower intellectual types. It's not so much the content of what he says, because it's not as though Barack Obama or George Bush or Bill Clinton ever said something that had me arrested in their brilliance. They all say profoundly idiotic platitudes that really cater to the average eight-year-old, except that one of them says them with a lot of grace and class, Barack Obama, while the other one is a bully brawler from Queens or wherever he's from. So could it not be as simple as most of us don't have the time to engage cognitively with all of the points that politicians make, so we use peripheral cues. What do you think about this possibility? I think that's partially true, but again, there's consequences to that. So I, I think because these, these peripheral cues generate a particular response, and I think the brutishness in, with which he often expresses himself brings out some of the brutishness in his followers. And so I think there are negative consequences to that. But I also think there is something unique about Trump. Um, he doesn't care in a way, he lies purposefully, they all do, granted they all do, but he doesn't care that you know he's lying, that his truth has no relevance in his, in, in the context. He is purely, and he said this in the 60 minute interview, he said this about something he said about Ford, but this is, this is true of everything he does. He said, what does this make? We won, right? So to him, victory is everything and justifies, will justify anything. And even even the crudest kind of so there's something unique in his willingness to be out there and say he doesn't say this but he implies this. I lie I'll say anything right right now he's saying we're gonna have a tax cut before the midterm election nobody that's impossible that's a purely impossibility but he says it without embarrassment without any he's never gonna apologize for it in a way that no other politician would ever do we brought out this. Everybody lies, but now the lies are so, you know, it's a new dimension uh, for lying. And he, he, he is a, he's a pragmatist who's proud of it. I'm willing to do whatever to achieve my goal. Everything goes, and I'm not going to apologize for that. That's, that's a new phenomenon in American politics. So he's uh, the alpha consequentialist, basically. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. In a, in a, in a, and, and a short-term consequentialist. It's not about long-term consequences. It's purely about short-term consequences. It's about how he, what he defines as wins. Right. That is that is the consequence that needs to be derived. I, I would argue that a lot of what he does is, is quite damaging long-term, but short-term, he gets his wins and he might do, electorally, he might do much better than people expect as, as a consequence of the fact that Americans want these short-term wins. Uh Maybe I'm putting you on the spot, but any predictions as to the upcoming midterm elections, both in terms of the House and the Senate uh, races? I mean, I'm pretty pathetic at these things. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I mean, clearly the Republicans will keep the Senate. I think it'll be a shock if they don't. Uh, they'll probably, I, I think it will be surprising if they don't pick up a couple of seats in the Senate. You know, this is the year, in a, in a normal year, you would think they, they could come close to 60 because uh, all the contested races are in Democratic defended seats in, in states Trump won. So they really, anything less than something like 58, 56 is a bad year in the Senate for Republicans. They're never going to have a year like this again. So they could have come close to 60. So that's in the House, you know, I have to go with the odds and the odds are that the House will, that the Democrats will win the House. Uh, but I think it'll be by a small margin. So I don't think it'll be a massive. Now, granted, you know, the last week or so has not been good for Republicans. I think the bomb thing and the the Pittsburgh thing have just have just reduced the energy around Republicans going out. Whereas the caravan really fed him talking about transgender stuff really fed the Republicans going out there. Um, so. You know, it's it, these things are so hard to call. But I think that I am pretty sure the Democrats will take the House, but by a smaller margin than the, than the Democrats expect. I mean, I think I would agree with this. Uh, Senate stays Republican, House flips to Democrats. I think I'll I'll sign up with that prediction. 
Uh, yeah, and, and and I don't think it'll be by such a large margin that the Democrats feel like they have a mandate now to do crazy stuff. So I think I, I, I don't think the consequences are going to be as horrific as if they win 60 seats in the Senate and uh, 60 additional seats in the Senate. And then they think, OK, they've got a mandate to, to go after Trump. And just, so we'll see what happens. But I, I think they'll be more moderate than expected. So the next two issues, in a sense, relate to one another. You And I think you mentioned one of them very briefly the yeah. birthright citizenship issue and the immigration. Let's let's drill down on each. So what's your position on the birthright citizenship? Before you answer, let me just say that I did a very quick search to get a sense of what it is around the world. What's the, and, and I, I, I haven't yet fully confirmed this. I just did a very quick, you know, cursory search. And apparently the, uh, is it Canada and the US are the only two sort of first world uh, countries that allow uh, birthright citizenship. Did I, did I get that right? Does that sound I, right? I mean, I'm not sure. I think there's some other countries, but it's clearly minority. So okay. it's clearly minority of first world countries that allow it. Look, yeah, this is, this is a, I think, a, a, a whole interesting question because, it, first of all, it's part of the Constitution. So this is going to go to the Supreme Court one way or another, and the Supreme Court will rule it. And if you want to change it, then I think you should change it through the legislature, not through executive order. This goes back to the whole authoritarian tendencies. This is not something for a president to sign away, given how it's been uh, interpreted for, you know, for a long, long time since the 14th Amendment was passed. And, uh, and, and it's something that's going to go to the Supreme Court one way or another. Look, in an ideal world, so this is me projecting my laissez-faire capitalist world. Um, in an ideal world, I think citizenship is a little tricky. I think, I, I think citizenship is something that I would maybe say um, even Americans uh, born of Americans might not automatically become citizens, right? So uh, I would say maybe to be a citizen, you have to pass it. In, in terms of citizenship, granting you the right to vote. And so I don't think voting is, is a universal right that necessarily everybody has to do it and, or, it's, or that it's that important in a truly free society. I think it's important when we live in a world in which you're you're trying to get my stuff and I'm trying to get your stuff and we're fighting over this common stuff that's in the middle. But in a, in a world where we don't have the ability to steal from one another, I don't think voting is that important. So uh, I would argue that in, a, in an ideal world, citizenship or, or the ability to vote is something one has to achieve uh, through maybe a test that proves that you know something about the foundation, foundational documents under which you are voting, something you know the Constitution. Do you do that it's, already? I mean, when you pass, when you have to go through your naturalization process, you it's have a to joke. Pass the test. It's a joke. There's, there's, it's, there's, easy? it's way too easy. Right. I mean, you, you you have to memorize a few things, and every everybody passes. Nobody ever fails it. I want something where you actually have to know what the Constitution says in 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 the Constitution, not just who your congressman is today, but how does this? What is the principle on which the the government? And the country is founded. So when you vote, you're voting in that context, whereas today nobody knows, including 90 percent of Americans. I mean, I'm not worried about immigrants. I think immigrants generally know more about the American Constitution, about the American founding than anybody who's gone through public school education in America. I think public school education in America actually perverts any knowledge you might have and distorts it, given the leftist tendencies and the, the ignorance uh, among academics of the American founding, of the meaning of the Constitution. So and and so, you know, I, I'm I'm generally of the opinion that in a free society, in you know, in my ideal America, it should be very very easy to come to the United States. Very easy. It should be very hard to become a citizen. Mm. That is, if you want to come and work, I have no problem. I'm I, I believe in free movement of labor and free movement of capital and free movement of goods across the world. But to vote to participate, to have a say in the political structure, that I worry about. And that I would want to, to, to have some barriers of entry before I allow you to vote. So, um, so I would create those barriers even for Americans born to Americans, not just for... So I'm a radical, right? So uh, yeah, I was going to ask, how do you reconcile this with... Uh, admittedly, I'm not a huge uh, expert on all of Ayn Rand's positions, but of course, the, the main lines, I, I get them. So as sort of someone who wishes to pursue, you know, selfish interests, egotism, e e e you know, et egoiste, as, as we say in French, uh, to be egoist, uh, what's wrong with a country saying, uh, look, if when you come in here, 
you don't provide us a clear when we do the accounting of your value to your country the net benefits that you bring in have to outweigh the net costs and if that calculus is not met you don't come in so for example if you pass the test the very difficult test that you'd like to impose but yep. yet i know that you're bringing in cultural and religious values that are perfectly antithetical to the ones that are foundational to our society i don't give a damn you're not coming in so isn't that the more sort of objectivist position to take? No, because because inherently that is a, a kind of a collectivist position. I, I don't believe that the government or the, the state ha should have any opinion about ideology. It, it's got a constitution. Follow the constitution. It should not be capitalist, socialist. It should not have a position about anything, a religion, any ideology. It should be neutral ideologically. In a de indeed, I, I interpret the separation of state and church in the Constitution as much broader than that. I would like to see a, a, a separation of state from ideas. I think the, the role of the state is to protect individual rights. It should have a complete understanding of what that means and how to do it. Other than that, it should have no involvement. So what scares me is when you give the state the power to say those ideas are anti-ethical to what we are and who we are. Well, I mean, I'm the first one who's going to be excluded <laughs> today, right? Why? If the state had that view, they would exclude my ideas because my ideas are anti-ethical, antithetical to to the the ideas of the of those in power today. I I don't believe the state should ever have that power. I also don't like the calculus. I don't like the calculus of how much you benefit society. Well, what is who is society? So um, I'm an I, so as an egoist, I want to be able to employ anybody. Anybody I want to employ. It's it's as long as that employee that I bring in, let's say I, I want to drive my truck down to Mexico, load it up with a bunch of employees, and bring them over to work in my manufacturing plant. As long as my employees are not infringing on your rights, and the only way they can infringe on your rights is by using violence against you or by committing fraud against you. Why is it any of your business that they're here? Now, I agree that they should be screened, make sure they're not terrorists, make sure they're not criminals, make sure they're not carrying infectious diseases or whatever. But as long as they're not a threat in that sense, then uh, they, they, should not be, they should not be controlled. Ayn Rand was very clear that the state should not have any role in determining ideology of those in the country or those coming in. Let me, let me push back a bit against this. So, sure. Uh, if, if the foundational thing that we both agree on is the protection and integrity of individual rights, if I allow people in in sufficient numbers who are fully committed to if they were ever in power, remove my individual rights, surely that seems to me to be within the purview of the government to protect against. And let me push, let me draw an analogy. Yeah. When, when you come from certain countries and you have, let's say, we screen you for diseases, right? And I mean, that what I'm about to talk next is very much the, the central premise of my book. I talk about instead of biological brain parasites, I talk about idea parasites, idea pathogens, right? So we can quarantine you or send you back because you have Ebola. We don't say, but, you know, who are we to judge whether one virus is better than the other? It's not for us to judge whether tuberculosis, right? We say, no, you come in with... Okay. So there are ideas that are fundamentally cancerous. They are cancers of the human spirit. And it's not a slippery slope argument. It's not, but who are we to judge? Because that's postmodernism, right? You're not allowed to push an idea that removes my individual right to live with full dignity. If you believe in such idea, that, that's sort of the old tolerance paradox of uh, Karl Popper, right? So, yeah. so how, could you, how could one say, but it's not for the government to judge which ideology is right or wrong. It is for the government. You're not allowed to come in here and have a seditious ideology that tries to put me under a burqa. No, I mean, you are allowed to do that in my view. Uh, and, and I do think there's an element of slippery slope here. That is, we're not going to agree completely. We're going to agree on the book. That we'll agree. We'll agree on certain ideologies. Clearly, we'll agree those are bad. But I, I would argue that um, most university professors, probably 90% of them today, hold ideologies um, that, are, and, that are clearly enemies of, of freedom enemies of dignity, enemies of individual rights. I, and, and here I, I'm much more concerned with American citizens than I, I am with immigrants. I don't think you could bring enough Muslims into the country to do, well, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but you could, but not enough Muslims would come into the country to do as much damage as university professors are doing right now. 
And I, yes, I, I sort of agree. Let me just interject because when I use my model of the mind viruses, I actually take an epidemiological approach where I look for where patient zero comes from. And of course, patient zero comes from the universities. So all these bad ideas are all from the universities. So I'm fully yes. on board with you. And, and patient zero, if you really have to think about patient zero, patient zero is Plato in my book. And, and a more modern play, pa patient zero is, is Immanuel Kant. Now, we might not agree with that. I know a lot of good people decent people who, who admire Plato, who think Plato was wonderful. Ideologically, I think they're part of the disease and they're destroying the country. But I don't want a government bureaucrat making that call. I, you know, I want, I want to be able to engage with them using reason. I want to be able to try to convince them. I want to, I, I, and I believe, I truly believe that a culture that is grounded in uh, the positive viruses, if you want to, uh, it's, a, it's a bad, it, that's a bad phrasing, but you know, the Aristotle virus that is, that is thread through Western civilization, which I think was responsible for the good. I want, I, I believe that in the long run, we win that debate. And to the extent that we use force against the, the Platonists, we use force against the Kantians, we use force against the Hegelians, the Marxists, uh, and the, 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 the ideological Muslims, put aside the, 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 practice, the practice itself, but the, the ideas of Islam, then, then we're violating one of the principles we believe in, which is freedom of speech and, 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 and freedom of assembly. So, uh, you know, you've got to allow people to hold bad ideas because once the government, I mean, think about Galileo and the Catholic Church. Think about any time in Western civilization we have tried to determine this is the truth, this is the right ideology. Now, if within a community you discover that women are forced to work brokers, then that practice needs to be shut down because force is unacceptable. If you see, I mean, the obvious one is grooming gangs, you know, which, which is just mind boggling that people would just sit, uh, you know, you need to shut it down. You need to shut it down quickly, violently, and, and, and equivocally. You need to declare it as a barbaric practice and, and put the people in jail forever so that you send a clear message about you are protecting individual rights. I think the failure of the West is one, we don't combat it ideologically. We don't actually declare our ideas are better. We, we reject these viruses. We're going to fight them. I think we did that. That would solve a big positive problem. And then we don't prosecute actual crimes. We don't prosecute when the, vi when the viruses manifest in actual acts of rights violations. We don't even... So we don't stand up for our own beliefs. That, to me, is the big problem. If we did... I believe good ideas trump bad ideas. Sure. One other quick example. When, when people came to America in the late 19th century, they brought with them a lot of bad ideas, particularly those German immigrants. They brought a lot of Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Marx with them. And you could argue they founded the progressive movement, and that's led to everything bad that exists today in America. So if we banned German immigrants in the 19th century, maybe America would be a better place to live today. But that's a scary idea for me, very scary, that the government would be in a position to start saying, these ideas are good, these ideas are bad. And so I would rather have the confidence that we, the good guys, can beat the bad guys, and that maybe the first generation, you can't. But if we had a proper educational system, if we abandon multiculturalism, we can suddenly get the second generation on our side. I mean, I guess uh, I would... Uh... I would say that I fully agree with you. I'm a free speech absolutist sure. and let all ideas enter the arena and let the best ones win, except, and here's the slight paradox, I guess, if demographically you get enough people who hold bad ideas that are intent on removing the capacity for us to engage in free debate of ideas. So as long as that tipping point is not ever reached, that removes our ability to both support free ideas uh, or the free debate of ideas, then I think I'm fine. Does that make sense? Yeah, the challenge is that the tipping point is being reached by the domestic citizenship. It's not being reached by immigrants. I mean, the fact is that if you look at campuses, Antifa is not immigrants. Antifa is, you know, I, I was attacked by Antifa in, in England and they were nice Brits. They were all, you know, you know, I, I, I once spoke at Exeter University in England and all these kids showed up with these with these uh, T-shirts with Nazi symbols in Israel, or Nazis, you know. I, I was talking about free speech and they attacked me for being Israeli. 
and they were pro-Palestinian. Not one of them was Palestinian. Right. Not one of them was Arab. They were all Brits with, you know, with, with nice posh accents. So my worry, is, I'm not worried about immigration. I think immigration, except in, in mass immigration, like in Europe, that certainly is a problem. But the, the immigration that comes into America doesn't trouble me one bit. I worry about Americans. I worry about what happens in kindergarten and in preschool and in high school and in, in college. I worry about the, the perversion that's happening with Americans and, and, and the, the well-educated Americans. Not even, you know, the better educated, the more perverse they get. Well, I think, uh, I think there was a recent survey or maybe it was sort of a non-scientific survey that what, uh, some guys were walking around campus and something like 50% of the interviewed students supported socialism or I, I can't remember the exact details. So I think that speaks exactly to your point, right? The viruses are spreading from inside. They're not necessarily coming from outside. So I'm with you. Uh, it's something like 60% of all democratic, uh, democratic self-identified democratic young people associated with socialism. Social. Exactly. But even among Republican young people, it was something like 20% of them thought socialism was a good thing. I mean, it was just mind-boggling, even and, among Republicans. And it's, so and it's truly impervious to empirical attack, right? Because every generation, a new group of idiots comes out that says, well, if only we implemented true socialism as opposed to the 180,000 other field experiments that failed. Uh, is there ever a way to slay the dragon permanently? Or is it just that the, the phoenix always rises again? The stupid idea is immortal. It's up to us every generation to fight the same bad ideas over and over again. No, I think I think it, you, we can slay it. At least, I mean, slay it as a as a as a dominant feature. Maybe it'll always come up as a as a minority, but I think we can slay it. And that's really the theme of my first book. And that is, I I, I think that that the issue is a, a moral issue. It's an ethical issue. I really think that as long as we teach our kids that uh, the ascent, that what makes one moral, that what makes one ethical, is to be selfless. It's to sacrifice oneself for others. It's to make others your focal point in terms of your actions and your thoughts in life. As long as we teach that as a moral ideal, we never teach that as a practical thing. Nobody actually lives that way. But we teach it as a moral ideal. As long as we teach that, socialism is by definition the most appealing system morally. Maybe not practically, but morally. Because it is the system of sharing. It's the system of sacrifice. It's very good at sacrificing whole groups of people for the sake of other people. It's, it's a system of suffering. It's a system of suffering for a cause, for something nobler, something greater, which is called equality. So, um, you know, both I guess both my, my books deal with this. So I think unless we're willing to challenge the fundamental ethical premises underneath socialism, then socialism will keep coming back. And this is why we ha I, I believe we have to advocate for moral individualism. Uh, you know, a, 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 an, uh, an Aristotelian kind of a view of, of or, or Ayn Rand, which I think is a development of Aristotle's view and a better a foundation than Aristotle. A, a moral individualism that says, no, I mean, there's nothing wrong with helping other people if it, if it's consistent with your own values, if it's not a sacrifice, if it doesn't entail suffering, you know, at least with regard to with regard to strangers, if it doesn't entail sacrifice, there's nothing wrong with it. But your central purpose in life, the central focus in life ethically should be on how to make yourself the best human being you can be, how to live the best life you can be and make the most of that life. So. Under that system, who wants to be a socialist? I want to be left alone so I can make the best life that I can. So, we, we, you know, capitalism is the only system that allows that. So I think, I think the revolution is not political or economic. Or we don't have to prove those things. Those have been proven already. I mean, I mean, God, we've, un, we've proven socialism wrong economically a thousand times. Um, it's moral. And unless we engage in a moral battle, if you will, we're not going to win this. The, the best one-liner dismantling of socialism slash communism that I've ever read was from E.O. Wilson, the evolutionary biologist who is an entomologist who studies social ants. Uh, he, 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 he said, socialism slash communism, wonderful system, wrong species. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, it's good for ants. That's, That's absolutely right. right. Once you have free will and reason, once you can think for yourself. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't say free will. You're going to trigger no, Sam Harris. Don't do it. 
<laughs> I have to. <laughs> I, I think free will is fundamental to all our political debates. I think we lose if we don't defend free will. I mean, this goes back to our discussion last time and, and, and to Sam Harris. Um, I, I think we lose if we don't recognize that people are moral agents, that they have responsibility for their own life. They make choices, choices. Cho you can't have choices without free will. Somebody is making a choice. But uh, yeah, I mean, as long as we are independent beings with independent minds that can make independent choices about our own lives, socialism is a disaster. And it's morally a disaster, again, because our moral responsibility should be self-perfection, if you will. It should be to our own happiness. And, and that doesn't exclude others because so much of our happiness depends on others. It means having the right kind of healthy kind of relationship with others that is non sacrificial that is ultimately win-win that is that is uh you know a, a a trader the trader principle where both parties win as a consequence of the trade let me see if i can reconcile some of the stuff that you support certainly from an ayn rand perspective with my scientific interests in, in evolutionary psychology and i don't think we touched on this the first time we chatted so it so one of the things that i do in several of my books is i argue that much of uh, consumer behavior could be mapped onto one of four key Darwinian modules or drives: uh, survival, which is which comes you know through natural selection, uh, mating or reproduction, sexual selection, and then kin selection, which explains kin-based altruism. That's the term altruism because it relates to, of course, Ayn Rand stuff. And then reciprocal altruism. So kin kin-based altruism explains why I jump into the river and save three of my brothers because uh, on average they share half their genes with me, therefore jumping and killing myself is still from an evolutionary calculus worthwhile. But reciprocal altruism explains why I engage in altruism to those who are not my kin. Uh, it could be my very close friend or it could be a random stranger. Yeah. Now from your view, uh, would, it, would it be correct to say that the way you would integrate what I just said about these basic evolutionary principles is that you're, you would say, and, and tell me if, if this is right, that yeah. kin selection and Kin-based kin altruism and reciprocal altruism are altruistic in a selfish interest calculus, and therefore that's how you reconcile them. And hence, that's why you know uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Richard Dawkins called it the selfish gene. In that sense, is, is, is that how you reconcile the whole thing? No, because I <laughs> partially because I I, I I'm going to question some of this, right? Okay. So I'm not going to jump into a river to say. My brother, necessarily, but a lot right? of people do. A lot of animals do. Yeah. It's documented. A lot of animals do. So, so this is this is the difference, right? And a lot of people do, and a lot of people do automatically. But this is my challenge to humanity, if you will, right? Let's get over the automatic, right? We have the capacity to choose. We have the capacity to think. We have the capacity to create a hierarchy of values and decide what is more important and what is it. Some brothers are worth jumping into the river to save because I love them and life without them would be meaningless to me or life without attempting to save them would be meaningless to me and I make that choice. Other brothers are bastards. Some parents are not worth loving and some people don't love their parents justifiably because they don't deserve it. Some parents don't love their children because their children don't deserve the love. It's not automatic. It, the inclination is automatic but it's overridden by choices that we make about the values we pursue in life. So, so the first point I would make is none of that to me, well, some people do it, but that's because they don't engage their reason. So if we take a step back, to me, survival, if, if we think about human survival, what it takes to survive, fundamentally what it takes to, for human beings to survive is to engage our reason. Uh, we, we don't know how to hunt. When we don't have the gene to dictate how we should build a weapon. We have to discover how to build a weapon. And you can see it in the evolutionary of weapons, how we make reason-based scientific methodology in figuring out. So what the genes, what we're in a sense programmed to do is if we choose to engage our rational capacity, we can build weapons. But there's no necessity, there's no determinism in terms of us building weapons. So I think the default is evolutionary in a sense that we have certain things that we'll do by default, but we can override the default. Boy, do we disagree here. 
I know. Everything is evolutionary. <laughs> Nothing is outside. Your capacity to reason does not exist outside of evolutionary oh, imperatives. Absolutely. Right? So some things, you're absolutely capacity. right. Right. Uh, some things are uh, are instinctual, right? So for example, the, the, the ethologist Conrad Lawrence, who won the Nobel Prize in 1973, demonstrated something called imprinting, which is the chick comes out of the egg and it has a Darwinian imprinting mechanism that says the first thing that I see moving must be mommy. Now, if yeah. he replaces mommy with a golden retriever, it will follow the golden retriever. So some things are what's called fixed action patterns. That's what you would call sort of imperatives. or, But the things that you are calling, oh, we override them, th those are simply higher order cognition that are also evolutionary based. So, so there is nothing that exists outside our biological reality. What do you think of that? Well, it depends what you mean by biological reality. So um, I think there's something completely different between human beings and other animals. I think this evolution has created something amazing and unique when human beings came out. For the first time, we have the capacity to write the software. A chick can't write the software, can't overwrite anything. It is, in a sense, determined to react to everything in a particular way from the moment it's born. First thing moving, that's mommy. Can't avoid it. You know, it, 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 you can't redo it. Human beings, and this is, I think, a, 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 a massive leap evolutionarily. Human beings have, have this ability to self-program. And, and this is what free will, I think, essentially is. Free, you know, free will is the ability to engage this faculty that evolution gave, gave us. It's not... God given, it's not, you know, it's from somewhere else. It's evolution created this, but it functions differently than any other mechanism in any other animal because no other animal can do what human consciousness can do, which is to override those instincts, if you will, or those inclinations that we're born with. And what human beings can do, which no other species can do, is we can create abstract concepts. And that ability to create abstract concepts. There's a methodology to it. You're not born with the abstract concepts. So it's, the abstract concepts are not coded in your genes. The ability to create the abstract concept is coded in your genes. So there's no concept of chair coded in your genes when you were born. What you have is the capability to observe different chairs and to abstract that into a chair or the, the ability to build weapons. But the weapon, the, the design of the weapon is not in your gene. So you have the capacity to have a, a, an abstract concept like peace, but you're not born with that coded in. You have the capacity to create it, to, to discover it, if you will. So that's what I think makes us human is that capacity to use our reason in a way that no other animal has. So the way that I would reframe everything that you just said in evolutionary language is as follows. And tell me if that then kind of joins with you. Uh, so you have different types of adaptations. Some adaptations are absolutely fixed. So for example, it is a fixed trait that we should be born with 10 uh, fingers and 10 toes, right? Other traits are, uh, have greater variance. Uh, for example, uh, our personality types have not been fixed because there is no one optimal personality type that evolution can, can select. Uh, other, types of ev uh, other types of adaptations are contingent-based adaptations, meaning in, in ecosystem A, release Darwinian mechanism X. In, in ecosystem B, release you know, Darwinian module Y. So, for example, the immune system is exactly built that way, right? The immune system did not evolve with zero degrees of freedom to only kill three pathogens, because if that were the case, you, if, if one of the pathogens mutates then we're dead. Therefore, it has to evolve the capacity of evolvability, right? Uh, behavioral plasticity is part of the human condition. So that which you're calling, you know, ability to reason and build, I would say those are just facultative adaptations that have to be so because they have to allow for us to adapt to different environments. Does that fit with what you're saying? Yes. Well, no, it doesn't really. Okay. Um, because and, and we go back to free will. We go back to to, to because um, not all human beings are going to um, 
engage in it. Uh, so there's no deterministic factor that says you're going to come up with this abstract concept. It, that's why I think there's a new, there's a, they're, they're original thinkers and 90% and of people are followers and they don't ever engage in that spark and that ability to, to, to really engage with reality fully. Um, and I don't think that's determined. I think there's something that, that for whatever reason, and I don't have a reason for it, and I don't think there, there necessarily is a reason for it. Some people engage in that capacity to create abstract knowledge, to, to reason, to think, and other people just mimic, mimic other people's. And they're very dependent on the exact evolutionary, I can't remember how you described it, but, but, but iteration. But I think if you actually engage in your capacity to reason, in your capacity to create abstract knowledge, you are actually creating new paths, new evolutionary paths. You are actually influencing. So I believe that you're a self-made soul. You're a self-made being. If you if you choose to be, not necessarily, but if you choose to be, you can actually shape who you are and what you are. So I, I give a huge role to this ability to choose and this ability to make decisions based on based on you, based on your 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 willingness to reason, to face up to reality. Is there anything? And actually, I I have to give a shout out to whomever uh, suggested this as a topic. For me to ask you, I yeah. thought it was a really good one. Uh, I don't remember who it is, but I received many replies. Sure, sure. uh, but if they're watching, thank you. Uh, is there anything in your reading of Ayn Rand that you originally read, bought into, but in retrospect today, because of new incoming evidence, you say, sure. "Oh no, sure. that's that's bullshit." Sure. Well, nothing I say that's bullshit. I have too much respect for her, but. Um, Sure. I mean, there's certain things I would I, I, I would disagree. I, look, I'm not a philosopher. So um, when I look at her philosophical system, when I read through her philosophical system, do I understand everything? Do I, do I agree exactly with how she formulates everything? Not always. But uh, but I'm, I'm cautious in challenging it because, you know, I, it's not that I'm a philosophical thinker. Right. When it comes to application of the philosophy, sure, there are particular things that I might disagree with. On, on how to apply the philosophy, I'm, I'm convinced. I'm, I'm pretty sure that she wouldn't agree with everything I do in terms of how to apply the philosophy to common events, or to, uh, or, 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 to or the way I, you know, I respond to certain things. I'm sure she would do it differently. I'm not trying to mimic her, but the framework, the philosophical framework that she introduced. No, I, I have no. Uh, I've seen nothing of the world that would tell me. No, that's not how it works. But it doesn't really surprise me that I, I don't see that because, again, I don't spend my time really delving deep into the philosophical issues. Uh, I, I, I'm much more concerned about how to apply them. And so far, when I apply them, it works. Kind of, it, 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 you know, it, it makes sense to me. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the understanding of evolution would have, I think she would have had some interesting, I think she didn't know that much about evolution. I think her understanding of evolution would have enriched her theory, because I actually think it's very consistent um, with, with the ideas of evolution. Now, whether it's consistent with the way evolutionary psychology is understood today, I'm not sure, but I think there's, I think there's more philosophy to apply to evolutionary psychology before it's a definitive done deal science. I mean, I think the relationship between science and philosophy is interesting. How we interpret scientific knowledge is basically dictated by the philosophy you bring with you. Um, so I, I, I think it would have enriched the system, there's no question in my mind. And there's still a huge amount of work to do. For example, she wrote a book called Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. It's an introduction, right? which means there's a massive amount of work to do to figure out a full theory of epistemology based on a few principles that she laid out. Uh, so it, it's not to say that her system is complete or to say, and I never say this, Ayn Rand's ideas, Ayn Rand's philosophy is not the truth. It's Ayn Rand's philosophy. It, it's quite reasonable that somebody will discover a flaw or, or, or something wrong with it. Uh, and new evidence, as you suggest, might come about that rejects something in it. And I'm completely open to that. Um, but it, it's not for me to, to do that philosophically. And I haven't done it. And, and, and you know, I haven't found that flaw. The, the reason why I ask is because one of the things that I'll certainly be talking about in my next book is this notion of uh, epistemic humility, 
the idea yeah. that uh, look, uh, uh, as scientists, we're always talking about provisional knowledge, right? Uh, I'm the first to say that, look, if, if some principle in evolutionary theory were to be falsified, then we're back to the drawing board. Now, the fact that the, many of these things are unfalsified is not because epistemologically they're non-falsifiable. It's because they're true. And people have tried endlessly to falsify these principles and they stood the test of time. And so in that sense, that, that, that's why I thought that was a really good question, because I think we, we can all potentially suffer from sort of ideological inertia where, the, you know, la, 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 there's no way you... And, and to the extent that she's sort of revered almost as a, you know, sort of philosophical guru, I just wondered if you might have succumbed to that. But No, and, 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 and surely people would look at me and say, I have, and, and, uh, and uh, you know... Test me, is I guess I guess the, the way to do, do, does what I say make sense or doesn't it? And that's the standard. But I, and I think I think this is the the challenge. I think that that um, scientists have right. Clearly, you know, you do scientific observation, and that's either true or false, right? But how we interpret this, and this goes to physics, this goes to any abstract field within science. How we interpret it is often guided by our philosophical point of view. When you study the different interpretations of quantum mechanics. A lot of that is, is not physics. A lot of that is philosophy. It, 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 not the phenomenon itself. The phenomenon itself is what it is. But how we explain it, how we understand it, and what path it leads us towards is dictated by philosophy. So in my view, to have at the end of the day a healthy science, one has to have a healthy view, a philosophical view, a healthy epistemology in order to be able to properly um, uh, interpret the science. And I fear that we don't. That is, if you look at philosophy departments in the world today, philosophy is in bad shape. I don't think it's in good shape. I don't think it is. I don't think it is healthy. And I think that's infecting the sciences. I think some of the, and I, I don't want to get into it, but some of the interpretations of quantum mechanics, I think, suffer from that. Some of the interpretations of, of other things suffer from that. I think some of the way physics has gone, and and I think that's true of all sciences have gone, is a consequence of bad philosophy. So I think as as if we can make philosophy healthy, I think we will discover not that the facts about the science have changed, but how we look at them, how we interpret them, how we understand them will change as well. You know, I, uh, I was going to ask you, wh when did uh, Ayn Rand pass away? 1982. So you would have been too young to have met. Did you ever meet her? I guess you never I met never her. met her. I was, when she died, I was actually, I remember the day because they, they announced it on Israeli radio. And uh, I had already read her book, so I was already uh, pretty okay. committed. Okay. And I was ironing my uniform, uh, getting ready. You, your to apartheid go. Nazi uniform. That's right, my apartheid Nazi uniform, getting ready to go and oppress some Palestinians um, or, or Lebanese, as the case right, was right, right. in 1982. Oh, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I was. This was March, I think, of 1982. So I was. I was on my way. It was a Sunday morning to go hitchhike uh, to base. Um, so I remember that and, and got together with some friends that evening to kind of celebrate the life. Uh, so uh, I, I was part of the, the objectivist world back then in Israel in, in the little capacity uh, that it was. I came close, well, no, not sorry. Let me, let me rephrase it. I, I think this was Karl Popper. I'll have to go back and double check. Uh, uh, I was when we lived in California. When I was at UC Irvine, uh, my wife and I would often go to uh, used bookstores to try to find yeah. books. Mainly, I would drag her reluctantly uh, to go to these bookstores. And uh, one day, I had asked her to uh, uh, go and ask. I was reading a book, and I, and she had gone to find out about a Karl Popper uh, biography or uh, so on, and. Uh, I, she goes away for a very long time. I, I hope I'm getting the story right. It's the first time I'm thinking about it. It's maybe 15, sure. 16 years ago. And she she returns uh, with a gentleman, a very sort of distinguished professorial looking gentleman. No, it wasn't Karl Popper, but almost was. And uh, she introduced, she, he says, oh, I hear you're looking for, what well, you know. Uh, yeah. And I say, I mean, yes. Uh, he, and it turns out that that gentleman was the guy who was handling sort of the popper archives. Oh, wow. Okay. And, cool. and he has since, uh, this was many years ago, he sent me sort of photocopies of, uh, you know, correspondences and so on. And I thought that was such a brilliant story. So that's what led me to think of whether you had met her or not. Yeah, no, I hadn't. I mean, and I wouldn't have, because I was in the U.S. in 1979. And you know, it never occurred to me to go 
at meet her because, I, you know, I was a young pipsqueak. I was nothing and nobody. Why would she want to meet me? So it never crossed my mind. Now, in, um, I didn't realize at that point there was a, a movement, there was a publication. I mean, I was, there was no, people don't have this context. Right? There was no internet. There, there was, we, I was in Israel. Finding a book was hard. Yeah. There was no connection in the sense that there is today. I mean, it's so beautiful that we have this connectivity on a global scale today. It's such a beautiful thing. I, I, you know, so there was no, you know, I, it never, for some reason, it never crossed my mind to look up what she gave me a talk. Maybe, maybe I could go see her. You know, I just, I just did my thing, and then, um, yeah. I, today, I regret it. I wish, I wish I'd be more arrogant and more confident and gone to see her. But, uh, but so be it. You know? Yeah, you know, I mean, speaking of connectedness, I mean, uh, every day I wake up with yeah. a with the excitement of a young child, because yeah. any, I mean, when you talk about the, the small world, right? We're all connected, unless it's a closed society by six degrees or less. I mean, that's even more so today. I mean, I've literally connected with people. I mean, your Ayn Rand is my, and I'll explain who it is, is my Russell Tompkins Jr., who is the lead singer of a group called The Stylistics, who was one of the top Philly soul groups of the 1970s, where yeah. we've become friends. This wow. is a guy who sang in my ear when I was seven and eight years old in Lebanon. Uh, he's come on my show. I went and hung out with him in Philadelphia. Uh, That's so and in what world would I, an academic, 20 years younger than this musical hero of mine, ever have a chance to connect with him? And so I'm always amazed that, not, you know, there are so few people that, certainly so few academics, that take advantage of these incredible toys that we have at our disposal today. Here's, here's Yaron and Gad talking as ah. if we're sitting in the same room. What, why do you think people are reticent, or certainly professors? Well, people, I think, take it for granted. So that's, I think, young people just are born with this. And they, they, you know, we lived in a generation with no internet. I mean, things have changed so fast. So we had no PCs. I mean, I don't remember what it'd be. I mean, I'm the first, I think I was the last class in my university. We, we programmed with punch cards. Oh, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. I had it in high school. In high school, I did that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's inconceivable today. Nobody even knows what they are. So, um, so we, I think, our generation probably appreciates because we've seen the change. We've seen the evolution. But I think academics don't take advantage of it because, I mean, most academics I know are very close-minded in a, yes. in a, which is so bizarre, right? So you, you sad, think it, so tragic. Yes. And it should be the opposite, right? Academics used to be renaissance, man. They used to know their field and then they, they would – you know, branch exactly. out, and they wanted. They were people who loved knowledge, right? That's what that's what a, a doctorate was about. You know, it was about philosophy, is the love of knowledge. It, 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 this is, and today, they're so you know, going back to ants, they're so interested in the little ants that they have specialized in that that's all they care about. And maybe they use Skype to talk to somebody else who's interested in ants across the world. But they have no interest beyond that, or if they do have an interest beyond that, it's so corrupted by modern philosophy, modern political correctness, modern uh, ideology that they use it for ill. But most of them, I mean, the fact is most academics don't do politics, don't, don't do ideology because they're so interested. There's over-specialization in, you know, in economics, that's a good thing. But in intellectual pursuits, it's a, it's a vice. Over-specialization in intellectual pursuits, even in science, is a vice. One has to have perspective. One has to have context. And to do that, one has to know a lot of things yeah. in order to specialize. Well, and I, I think it actually, and I, I, it came up recently in a chat. I can't remember with which guest I had on where we were talking about. So my mind works in a very consilient driven way, right? Consilience, to go back to E.O. Wilson, consilience is the idea of unity of knowledge. My brain is constantly looking for ways to navigate through different landscapes and connect them yes. because synthetically. This is why, as I was even, if you, if you remember my earlier question to you, when I said, okay, let me, let me hit you with some evolutionary psychology and see how I can reconcile it with your sure. Ayn Rand stuff. Uh, now, to, to be someone who is consilient driven, you have to know what it is that you want to unify. Therefore, you have to navigate through 35 different landscapes to try to create synthesis. 
I think you're exactly right. Most academics are not trained to think that way. They hyper-specialize. They know about the endocrine system of this particular leaf-cutting ant, and it ends there. Don't ask me to deviate epsilon from that. I'm not willing to speak about it. How do we get them to change this? Is it just pedagogy? We have to teach people how to be better conciliant thinkers? Well, this is, this is a great point. It links to some of the discussion earlier. I mean, I would call this... I, I, I can't even pronounce the word, but I would call it an integrated mind, an integrative mind, right? We're integrating, and, and I've noticed that that's how my mind works. I'm constantly trying to integrate new knowledge into existing knowledge and, and figure out whether it's consistent, whether there are problems, whether the issues, how do I resolve those issues, constantly trying to create unity. And to me, that is a healthy mind. That is, the, that is what reason is all is part of an important feature of reason is to integrate constantly integrate mind into unity of, of knowledge into unity of truth at the end of the day and i think we at some point in our lives right made a choice to do that where other people have not because i know people smarter than me who can't see connections between things that to me are obvious but they, they have a much higher iq than i have but they can't see because their mind doesn't work that way they're very good at analyzing X, and that's all they're good at. How you do that, I don't know. I mean, I wish I knew, it, 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 because it's hard to, 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 in a sense, rewire people's conceptual habits. I think we have to get them when they're young. We have to teach them to make those integrations. You know, Ayn Rand used to, they used to play a game in Ayn Rand's parlor, right? Um, where it, was, it used to be called concepts in a hat, and they used to put all these abstract concepts, piece of paper, abstract concepts in a hat, and you used to draw two randomly, and then you would have to show how they're connected. Wow. In the, yeah. And so, for example, you could say that in Atlas Shrugged, one of the things Ayn Rand is trying to show is how economics and sex are connected. Now, and it's true because she would argue that the, the same philosophical orientation towards economics would drive a particular view of sex that they're integrated through philosophy. So your attitude towards sex and your attitude towards economics are going to be driven by certain fundamental ideas. And, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a speech in Atlas Shrugged about sex, and there's a speech about money given by the same character, Francisca Conia. And they're very, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a relationship there. So that kind of game, that kind of idea about connecting things, I think is something we don't do in school. We, we teach subjects as completely separate, unrelated. We need to teach kids to think conceptually and to integrate across, across their knowledge. And, and I think there is a real you know, downstream benefit to teaching people how to think oh, yeah. synthetically because some of the most important scientific problems simply cannot be solved by one discipline. So most of the great scientific breakthroughs have really come at the intersection of interdisciplinarity. So it's not just that, you know, philosophically or epistemologically, it's nice for people to think synthetically. It's that good science fundamentally requires that. Now, you could still do stuff in your little silo, but it's, 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 it's it's inconsequential science. Big Great. stuff, mapping the human genome could not have been done if you had one group of experts. And the way I try to, to teach people this, at least certainly within the purview of my influence as a, as a professor, is I try to navigate through sort of the, the, the tight rope balance of to specialize versus to be broad. So I tell them, look, of course you have to plant your flag in some field to be known as an expert in this area, but always retain your intellectual curiosity. And the, the argument that I give or the analogy is I say, look, there are so many beautiful islands in the Caribbean that I'd like to visit. I could always return to Turks and Caicos because it's a beautiful island. Or uh, in 50 years, I could say I've been to every single one of them and I've been richer for it. So seek to visit many intellectual landscapes. Don't return to the same island. Absolutely. And, and you know, part of my struggle within kind of my objectivist world is to tell people, don't just read objectivist literature. That would be crazy and, and it would be ignorant. You know, go out there and read people you hate because you need to know because they're influential, right? Marx is influential. If you don't know more what Marx said, how can you combat him? How can you know why is he affecting so many minds? You have to understand Marx 
in order to really deal with it. You don't know that you hate Marx until you read him, right? Until you encounter the ideas explicitly. So it, it, it's, it, it really is um, important for people to broaden their scope, broaden their mind into other fields as well. And it, it's not just about science. I mean, you're obviously in science, so it's important in your field, but you get, I think if you get, if we get better thinkers in the world, then ideology, you know, ideologically we'd be better, politically we'd be better, in every realm of our lives we'd be better. And I think just spiritually we'd be better. I mean, I, I like lots of different types of music. I'm, I, I listen to a lot of different types. Some I hate, but I've heard enough to know I don't like that and I, and I don't want it. I, I'm not just fixated on one thing and do one thing. I love to go to museums. I love to, you know, go through and see the different eras because I want to experience different things and see what I like and what I don't like. And until I encounter it, it's hard to in advance decide these, you know, these things. You have to actually study it. Do you regret, uh, since we're, we're talking about the yeah. state of academia, do you ever today regret that you left academia or is every day a confirmation that you made the right choice? No, I don't regret it. I mean, I, I've had so much fun doing what I'm doing that, that I don't. I mean, not that I hated academia. I, I enjoyed academia. But I do remember I remember sitting with my, with my colleague. We were hired at the same time and, you know, did our research together. And, and we were, became really good friends and business partners ultimately. Sitting one day, you know, watching all the students who keep getting younger every year. It's terrible. Um, and, uh, and watching them and saying, you know, can you imagine sitting here in 30 years teaching the same thing to the same students? I've never, I, 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 you know, so it, even then, even in my first few years, it was hard for me to, to imagine myself being an academic in the long run. Again, not that I didn't like it. I, I enjoyed it. Particularly, I love teaching. Teaching is my, my passion. Um, the research I found, I, I wasn't that interested in, uh, primarily because I, I felt like I was captured by what the journals expected me to publish, and it wasn't that interesting, and it wasn't, I, I was interested in more abstract knowledge, which is hard to publish in journals. Uh, you know, the theory of finance, people were less interested in, in challenging, and I, that, that's where I was, would have wanted, if I'd stayed in academia, that's where I would have wanted to go, kind of. You know, we know, we know, I, I, my sense is behavioral finance is interesting, but not completely true. Uh, the kind of the absolute efficiency market theory of Eugene Pharma is interesting, but not completely true. There's something about both of these things that needs an integration. You need to be, be able to integrate the, the way a market works to make itself efficient and the the cognitive issues and, and the way people behave, the behavioral aspects of all of this. And there has to be a way to integrate that into a, a, an, an objective theory of how markets work and how financial markets work, which I don't think anybody's done. It still hasn't done, which I would have loved to have worked on. But no, I mean, I've had too much fun. I mean, I've, I've loved everything that I've done. I, you know, now I'm, my, my wife claims I'm semi-retired, but I'm working harder than I've ever worked. You know, I travel around the world speaking. I mean, what could be better than that? I mean, in two weeks, I'll be in, seven or eight different countries giving talks and uh, engaging. I engage with thousands, thousands of students every year. So it's a lot of fun. Nice. Uh, speaking of behavioral finance, as you mentioned earlier, yeah. did you know that uh, the last, well, now two Nobel Prizes ago, Richard Taylor was my professor? Yes, you told me that oh, last, last time. Last time, okay, yeah. Uh, did you, do you know him? I never met Richard Taylor, but two of his... Two of the leaders of the or early leaders in the behavioral, behavioral finance were in my department. It's Santa Clara was known at the time when behavioral finance was still kind of marginal, very marginal. Uh, Thaler was the only one really with a big name. Um, uh, Host Sheffrin, who wrote a book on yeah. behavioral finance, and Mayor Statman. Both of them were in, in a department of five. We Goddamn two, Jews everywhere. The Jews are everywhere. Well, you know, it was a problem with hiring me at Santa Clara because he was a Jesuit university who had one Israeli already who was the chairman of the department, another Jew, right, a Korean, an Indian, and they had no Americans. They had no kind of white guys, right? And um, supposedly it was a real issue in my hiring, the fact that I, he was another Jew coming in at the Jesuit university, and the Jesuits were really not happy with this, and they hired the guy who became my business partner, luckily, he was the token white, you know, American, nice. white guy from the Midwest. He was perfect for them. So they hired him and then they could justify hiring me, another Jew, into the department. So. They, they could kind of dilute the Jewness. 
Yeah, that's right. right. Very nice. Well, right. and the foreigners, there were Jews and then there were Asians. Right. The right. whole finance department were Jews and Asians. I mean, this was mind boggling to the poor, the poor Jesuits. And, and then, of course, they regretted hiring me, not quite from day one, but about a, a couple of years in. So the mistake the Jesuits did is it, this was in 1993. And it was just after all the Wall Street stuff that was happening. And they came to the finance department and said, look, guys, we want you to teach a class in ethics, finance and ethics. And all my finance guys were like, we don't want to teach ethics with finance guys. And I said, I'll do it. I'll do it. Because I was always interested in philosophy. So I said, they said, oh, wow, you're on. That's great. Somebody will teach finance and ethics. And then they discovered what I was teaching. And all hell broke loose. I mean, and not only that, it was the students loved it. It won teaching, I won teaching awards for it. And it was the exact opposite of what they wanted me to teach. I was teaching the nobility of finance, the nobility of making money, why the profit motive was a good thing and a noble thing. And, and why finance was an ethical endeavor in and of itself. And that's not what they want to talk. Right? They wanted yeah. what? Capitalism is evil and greedy? Yeah, they oh. wanted, they, they, they were leftist Jesuits. These were the liberation theology Jesuits. They wanted, and Catholics, right, generally, they wanted you should feel guilty for making money. But, you know, we need you. So, you, you know, so you have to do what you do, but you should feel guilty while doing it. And you should behave ethically. You should always have that altruism in the back of your mind. Which brings me to the other point about altruism. I just wanted to make this point. It just reminded me. Altruism is a philosophical word that has a particular meaning, right? So again, in philosophy. It's a term coined by Augustine Comte, the French philosopher of the 19th century. And the way he termed altruism means, it doesn't mean behaving nicely towards somebody else or, or doing something kind to somebody else. Or, or, or it means living for the sake of others. So for Kant, the purpose of life was to sacrifice your life for others every single day, all the time. So to the extent that you thought about yourself, think about this from an evolutionary perspective, to the extent that you thought about yourself and your own survival and your own well-being, that was out morally. Any thought, so if you said, I'm going to help this person because they're make me feel good, not moral, right. because you brought yourself into the decision making, right? It's the complete negation of self. So philosophically, altruism means the selflessness, the negation of self. It doesn't mean what I consider, what you think of reciprocal altruism is often in my book, just the trader principle, right? Uh, every trade you could think of, you know, when I buy an iPhone, it's reciprocal altruism. I, you know, I'm, I'm giving something to Apple and I'm except, getting something from it. Except, Apple, right? sorry, the, that's, the exchange is happening immediately, whereas okay. in reciprocal altruism, I jump into a river today hoping that in the future, if I'm going to drown, you will reciprocate in kind. So it's a bit I different. Yeah, so people do that. And, but I don't really think anybody, you know, I don't jump into rivers unless I thought about it before. And so I give myself two seconds to think about, do I want to jump into this river? What's my probability of survival? Do I know this person? Are they nice or not? Right? So I don't jump into the river for anybody. And, and what's his name? Um, do you know... Um, Oh my God, the, the ethicist who has this this thing about the rivers. Um, so so he gives this he gives this example. Uh, Peter Singer, Peter Singer, the famous ethicist, right? You mean Peter Singer who was on my show? No, I never heard of him. Probably Peter Singer who was on your show. Everybody's been on your show. So Peter Singer has this thing about you're walking down along a river and there's a kid drowning in the river and you're wearing an expensive suit and and, and it doesn't cost you anything. You can go in the suit will be ruined. You're not risking your life. Do you go in and save the kid? And everybody would go, well, of course. And his response is, well, there's a kid drowning in a river every single day. And all it would cost you is a couple of hundred dollars to save him by sending him to Africa. Now, that's a logical twist there, right? If there was a river where if I walked by every day there was a kid drowning, um, first of all, I wouldn't wear the expensive suit every day. And secondly, at some point, I would take a different route home. My purpose in life is not to save kids in drowning rivers. I feel no guilt for sending zero dollars to Africa. Uh, I think by changing the ideology, I would probably save more kids in Africa than anything else. But it doesn't inflict any guilt, the fact that I know, I know with certainty that some kid is dying. I could send money and save him, and yet I choose not to. I feel no guilt about that. My focus in my life is on me. I'm willing to save a kid in a river if it's an emergency, if it's a once in a while, if it happens. But if it becomes a regular habit, I ain't doing it. So my whole approach to helping other people is not they'll help me back. 
if I do help them. My approach to helping other people is other people have value to me. I benefit from the existence of other people in all kinds of ways, not because they'll save me in a river, but because they produce stuff that I benefit from. One of them might be an, the next Einstein who creates something that is going to change the world. Um, but just by the fact that they're basically good people, I am better off for other people's existence. I love plants. I, you know, you have you have pets. I don't, but you have animals you love. Human beings are even better than animals, right? So I love, in a sense, I love human beings, right? Now, if I know that you're bad, I don't love you. But if, if, if I don't know anything about you, I'll give you a huge benefit of the doubt. And, and that's why I would save somebody. It's because of that benefit of the doubt, the assumption that you're a good person, and I will benefit from you, not by you saving me, but by the very fact that you exist, produce, create, and do the things that you do in your life. So do you think, since you mentioned Peter Singer, do you think that his recent uh, participation in a movement called Effective Altruism, are you familiar with that idea? I am. Um, do you yeah. think yeah. that that is something that you could get more behind because it seems to be a bit better targeted in its intentions versus sort of the random let's let's help some child somewhere in Africa or or not are are both things that no, no, I, so there's a no question I think I think that it's an a, an improvement and I think that it's I mean Peter Singh is a clever altruist I mean he's 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 brilliant and he's he's very smart and, and effective altruism is a nice innovation. Um, no, I, because Peter Singer views it as a, a moral duty, and I don't, and, and that's a huge difference. I view Peter as the enemy. I mean, literally, philosophically, as and this goes back to your viruses and bad ideologies. I mean, if I could exclude Peter, Peter Singer would be on the list of people I would not want to get citizenship, right? So I, I don't want him voting. I don't want him teaching my kids. I don't want him anywhere near a, a podium, And but, it, but I believe in free speech, so I'm, of course I'm going to let him do it. So, um, no, I, I, I think the whole PETA is, is all about, and it takes seriously, and I respect him for taking it seriously, it, it, all about this idea of the purpose of life is to serve others and we're going to make it efficient to serve others. I don't want serving others to be efficient. I want people to focus on their own well-being. And as a, if, if part of that well-being is to help others, and I think in many cases it is, but not always, then, then go for it, then do it as effectively and rationally and, and, and the best that you can. But make sure first and foremost that it's consistent with what it means for you to be a good human being. And of course, I, I believe, you know, at different stages of life, you should be more or less charitable. I think it's ridiculous if you're young to be charitable. You're way too busy. There's way too much things for you to do for you to, to engage in charity. As you get older, as you have some excess cash, capital, you know, cash and and you have a little bit of time maybe, then maybe, it, you know, that becomes a bigger focus in life. But certainly when you're young, I don't believe you should even think about charity before the age of 50. Well, or community I, service or any of these things. Right? Nice. Uh, I Looking at my list, there's probably still another half of the things that I wanted to talk to you about have not been covered, which simply means there's good news. We're going to have to hold a third conversation soon. Uh <laughs> Horrible, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything that you would like to use this platform to promote that people might not otherwise be familiar with? Well, I, I, I have a YouTube channel like all of us do and, and, uh, and uh, we encourage people to check it out. Um, and uh, those of you who find some of these ideas interesting, uh, einrad.org or yourownbrookshow.com, I think that's the URL. I mean, uh, there's... there's there's endless amounts of material if you want to go and investigate. It's it's uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff, and of course I think everybody should read Atlas Shrugged. Uh, agree or disagree? I think it's it's kind of a, one of those required islands one has to visit. <laughs> Very yeah. nice. Thank you for using the uh, the GAT analogy or metaphor. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. It was so well, nice talking to you. Uh, likewise, we'll do it again very soon. Stay on the line. Thanks, guys. And if you love these types of conversations, people, if you sat through this almost 90 minutes, consider supporting both uh, Yaron and myself on our... Uh, you have a Patreon account, correct? I do. I do. So support either both of us or one of us. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.